Hi, this is the third of three videos reviewing general relativity in a bottom-up fashion. This video looks at how to measure the speed of light and how to measure the variation in the speed of light. We'll also look at how this variation in light speed explains the bending of light and also how a breather accelerates in the direction of slower light. Let's get started. Let's construct a simple device to measure the speed of light. We have a metal rod that is one unit long. At one end we have a flash maker and at the other end a mirror. Next to the flash maker is a detector and a clock. When the flash is created, the detector starts the clock. The flash bounces off the mirror and is again detected to stop the clock. The flash travels two units of distance in two units of time. So the speed of light is measured to be one. As before, we choose units where the speed of light is one. Let's play that back again without interruptions. So with this device in hand, let's take a minute and look at how locally we always measure the speed of light to be one, even when space and time deform. Our hypervoxels are one unit long on each side. And locally, we measure the speed of light to always be one in each direction because the clock always stops at two units of time. As in the previous video, we suppress one dimension of space and visualize the time dimension. Now let's say a neighboring region of space has slow motion time. How does this affect our device? Well, slow time simply means that clocks run slow and that the flash moves at lower speed, and those two things cancel out. Both clocks stop at 2, so locally the speed of light is measured to be 1. Now, the time in the video is a global time coordinate, little t, which is sometimes called bookkeeper time. This time coordinate is different from the local time coordinate, capital T, of the sticks, which is also called proper time or wristwatch time, the time that someone sitting there would experience or see on a wristwatch. In the same way, the speed of the flashes shown in the video is the bookkeeper speed of light, which varies in contrast to the proper speed, which is always one. Let's go back to three dimensions of space. Just like the hypervoxel can stretch in time, it can stretch and squeeze in the space dimensions. In this case, both clocks run at the same speed, but the bookkeeper distance, and therefore the bookkeeper speed of the flash, change depending on direction. Again, the two changes exactly cancel out, so the locally measured value is still 1. Now let's apply this to the real world. Let's look at the Schwarzschild spacetime from the previous video. There we saw that near the event horizon of the black hole, the hypervoxel gets squeezed in the radial direction. Also, the time slows down near the horizon. Let's look at the hypervoxels from above. When we put the devices perpendicular to the radius, then they will have the same length but the speed of their clocks will vary. So the bookkeeper's speed of light is different. And when two devices are at the same radius, but at different orientations, then their clocks will run at the same speed, but they will cover different distances because of length contraction. In other words, the bookkeeper's speed of light differs in the two directions. Now, these little devices always measure the local speed of light to be 1. At the same time, we see that the bookkeeper speed of light often is lower than 1. Can we measure this bookkeeper speed of light? Yes, we can. We just need a longer device. This device is 5 units long, so the clock will measure 10 units of time. Now, because it's boring to wait for 10 seconds, we'll sometimes fast forward the process, like this.
So let's put the device in our Schwarzschild space-time. It stretches across regions of space where the speed of light changes from fast to slow. And different parts of the device compress by different amounts along with the hypervoxels. When the flash travels close to the black hole, it slows down, then speeds up again after the bounce. And the clock shows about 12 seconds, which is more than 10. Since we know that the total distance is 10 units of length, the average speed of light was 0 0.82. This delay is called the Shapiro delay and is one of the four classic tests of general relativity. Let's draw a graph of the path of the light flash. On the blackboard, the x-axis is the distance from the flash maker, and time runs upward. So let's repeat the measurements. Because the speed of light changes along the path, the graph is not two straight lines. Instead, it curves a bit. As we get close to the event horizon, the speed of light goes to zero. Let's move the device a little closer. When we repeat the measurement, the total time doubles to 24 seconds. In fact, if we put it even closer to the event horizon, we can get the total time to be anything we like, for example, a billion years. So, you may then wonder if the light flash can actually ever cross the event horizon. It's a good question, and we'll dedicate a level 2 video to this issue, which has irritated a great many people. Now, all this talk about proper values and bookkeeper values, what is it good for? What are some conclusions? Well, neither is just an artifact of the choice of coordinates. Both are physical, but they do show up in different kinds of measurements. The bookkeeper speed of light also explains the bending of light. First, let's look at how a prism works. Here's a prism made of some glass for which the speed of light is one half. In vacuum, the speed of light is one. And here's a light flash. We'll think of it as being made of two parts that travel in parallel. When it enters the glass at an angle, the left half gets there first. During the next time step, the left half travels at half speed inside the glass and doesn't get very far. The two halves want to stay together at a fixed distance, as if they were connected by an axle, so they have to turn in the direction of slower light. Then the right half enters the glass, and they travel at the same speed. This is just like the cart that we saw in the first video, where one wheel is faster, and so the cart turns. In a Schwarzschild spacetime, there is a similar difference in the speed of light between the two halves of the flash. The difference is smaller than for the edge of glass, but is continuous for a long stretch. The path, or geodesic, is shown by the sticks. And just like in the first video, it bends with curvature. Again, this bending is in the direction of slower light. Now, for kicks, let's add a mirror so the light flash can bounce at 90 degrees. See where I'm going with this? Just like in the first video, we cannot make a square in curved space. Another thing that senses the variable speed of light is the breather from the video on special relativity. There we saw that a breather is a localized wave where energy is trapped in a small region. We saw that it obeys special relativity in that it contracts, slows down, and desynchronizes. It turns out that it also obeys an effect of general relativity. It accelerates towards slower light. The equation for the breather contains a constant c, which is the limiting speed of breather motion. If we make c vary, then a breather that is initially at rest starts to move in the direction of slower light, and the speed increases at a constant rate, that is, at a constant acceleration. As a side note, when you compute differential equations numerically with finite differences, you can solve the wave equation with constant c on a uniform grid. If you then stretch this grid in t and adjust your finite differences, you have the equivalent of variable c. As an alternative, keep the grid spacing uniform but vary c. 
These two options are very similar to our two ways of thinking about curvature, stretch or deforming place with variable speed. So to summarize, we have three particle models, the cart, the flash made up of two halves, and the breather. All have a little bit of size so they can sniff out the immediate environment and see if there is a gradient. When a particle only feels the force of gravitation, it follows the geodesic. And it turns out that if you calculate the path of the cart with wheels at varying speed and size, you can derive the geodesic equations. In the next video, we look at how space moves and expands, gravitational waves and wormholes. I'll see you there. For more videos, go to physicsisnotweird.com and I'm Aiden Bernander.